So turning to video five, treatment of psychosis and schizophrenia in children and adolescents, the antipsychotic dosing, monitoring, and side effects. So treatment guidelines for psychosis and schizophrenia in children, adolescents, their treatment options for the management of schizophrenia include antipsychotic medications, psychoeducation, psychosocial interventions, adjunctive medications, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT in rare cases. So let's start with antipsychotic medication because that's the primary treatment for schizophrenia spectrum disorders in children and adolescents. Generally, second-generation atypical antipsychotics, SGAs for short, are preferred for the initial treatment. And second-generation antipsychotics currently approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of early-onset schizophrenia include aripiprazole, lorazidone, olanzapine, paliperidone, quetiapine, and risperidone. Several first-generation typical antipsychotics that also called FGAs or first-generation antipsychotics are also FDA-approved for pediatric patients of different ages, below age 12, and for ages 12 and above, and these include chlorpromazine, loxapine, perfenazine, thiothixine, thioridazine, trifluoperazine, and haloperidol. What we know from recent data from adult and child or adolescent studies, as well as meta-analyses, reviews, support the superior efficacy of the antipsychotic medications compared to placebo. However, the efforts to rank the efficacy and effectiveness of different antipsychotic drugs have not found any particular antipsychotic to be superior, with the exception of clozapine. We do know that there's a lower risk of extrapyramidal Parkinsonian adverse events with second-generation antipsychotics that's led to an increase in the prescription of second-generation antipsychotics in children and adolescents. And this lower extrapyramidal adverse events, Parkinsonian risk, needs to be balanced, though, against serious risks of metabolic side effects, such as weight gain, that can be quite high and seems to be at increased risk in younger children more than in adolescents who have a higher risk of weight gain than in adults, dyslipidemia, diabetes, side effects in these medicines. So given the caveat that there are these challenges and one antipsychotic drug doesn't seem to be any superior to any other antipsychotic with the exception of clozapine, how do you choose an antipsychotic? The choice of which antipsychotic agents to use is necessarily highly variable, depends on the patient's overall health, possible drug-to-drug interactions with other medicines, patient and family preferences based on potential side effects, specific monitoring requirements and medication costs. One other thing I like to do is to ask about familial history because it's not a guarantee, but we do know that in general, Patients who have a first-degree family member that has responded well to a particular medicine or antipsychotic, the likelihood of the patient responding well increases. And conversely, if the first-degree relative has not responded or had an adverse side effect, the patient themselves may be more at risk to experience a side effect. So it's very important to get that family history Individual response to different antipsychotics is also highly variable, and a different antipsychotic should be tried if insufficient effects are evident after a six-week trial using adequate doses. Medication dosing guidelines for early-onset schizophrenia. Aripiprazole, the initial recommended dose is 2 milligrams per day, and we target 10 milligrams per day. A maximum dose is 30 milligrams per day. I like to start low, go slow, and we may end high, but what you're wanting to monitor is how well is the patient and what is the lowest dose with the maximal benefit, the closest to wellness, 
without significant side effects. Lorazidone, the initial dose is 40 milligrams per day. Target dose range is 40 to 80 milligrams per day. You don't want to go higher than 80 milligrams per day as a maximum dose. Olanzapine, the initial dose is 2.5 to 5 milligrams per day. Target dose is 10 milligrams per day with a maximum dose of 20 milligrams per day. Paliperidone, initial dose of 3 milligrams per day. 3 to 6 milligrams per day is going to be the target for those patients under 51 kilograms. For patients greater than or equal to 51 kilograms, a target dose of 3 to 12 milligrams per day is typical with maximum doses of 6 milligrams per day. If you're less than 51 kilograms, 12 milligrams per day for those patients with weights of greater than or equal to 51 kilograms. Quetiapine has an initial dosing of 25 milligrams BID a target dose of about 400 to 800 milligrams per day and a maximum dose of 800 milligrams per day. Now, it's worth pointing out that with quetiapine, a lot of people find it to be a very sedating, effective sleep aid. And so some people go away from the BID or twice daily dosing and just give the bedtime dose. That's something to monitor. And depending on the target symptoms, you can determine what the best dosing strategy is. We do know, for example, that for compliance issues and treatment adherence, fewer doses can be preferable, but sometimes the twice-daily dosing can be the way to go, particularly at higher doses. Risperidone, the initial dose is 0.5 milligrams per day. The target is 3 milligrams per day and the maximum dose is six milligrams. Now, I will say with risperidone that it's not unreasonable to start 0.5 milligrams per day, but in some younger children, adolescents with the diagnosis, some who I know or am concerned may be exquisitely sensitive to medications, I may even start lower at, say, 0.25 or a quarter milligram per day and see how they tolerate that That's not going to be sufficient for early onset schizophrenia, but it may give their body more opportunity to safely adjust to the medicine. Again, not required, and you want to individualize that approach, but something definitely to consider. General monitoring recommendations for antipsychotic medications at baseline are the detailed personal, family, and lifestyle history, and that needs to be updated regularly. The height, weight, BMI, and repeating that at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and then at least every three months thereafter, fasting, blood glucose, and lipids at baseline, and repeat every six months at baseline. In three months, we want to check for Parkinsonism, akathisia, tardive dyskinesia, the blood pressure, pulse, electrolytes, complete blood count, renal and liver function, and repeat annually. You want to look at prolactin and obtain that if the patient is symptomatic. Be particularly vigilant for this if the patient is on risperidone. Electrocardiogram, you want to obtain this at baseline for clozapine, also during the titration and at the maximum dose. Thyroid functioning test, thyrotropin, free T4. TSH, you want to obtain that at baseline and follow up with quetiapine. I also like to be alert for thyroid function testing if that's not been done before as psychiatric symptoms are common with thyroid abnormalities. Increase the desire or need to get thyroid function tests even if you're not really seeing signs or symptoms, but there's a familial history An eye examination recommended at baseline in six-month intervals with quetiapine. Suicidality, we have to monitor for suicidality. 10% of schizophrenic patients commit suicide. Many, many more attempt suicide. So depressive symptoms in schizophrenia are not uncommon, and the relationship with the medicine can be complicated. And frankly, when the medicine works, that may reduce the risk of suicidality. And 
that occurs throughout the course of schizophrenia. The bottom line is if you start a new medicine or treatment, you have to monitor it very, very closely, particularly in the beginning and the first several weeks and longer if you're changing doses in particular, and you want to be monitoring it every visit and very closely. And these are guidelines. Obviously, if you're watching and monitoring patients or you think the risk is higher, this is something you may want to do more frequently. The key is to be vigilant and not expect that there's some routine cookbook recipe that works for all patients. The individual approach is necessary because the solution here is always individualized. Side effects and risks in the second generation antipsychotics, we're just going to review the highlights. Weight gain, the higher risk is going to be with olanzapine and clozapine. Moderate risk is risperidone, quetiapine, and the lower risk is thought to be aripiprazole. But I want the caveat here that that's only in overall groups. And so a patient on aripiprazole can have severe weight gain, severe side effect. You have to worry about that in every patient. Hyperprolactinemia, risperidone appears to have a particularly high risk and higher than olanzapine. Clozapine appears to be prolactin neutral. And aripiprazole is actually associated with reduced prolactin levels. Hyperglycemia, the higher risk appears to be with risperidone more than olanzapine. But again, even with other medicines, you want to be on the lookout. The same applies with a rise in cholesterol levels. The higher risk appears with quetiapine compared to olanzapine. But again, you want to monitor for cholesterol levels in all patients on second generation antipsychotics. The same applies for triglyceride levels. The higher risk appears to be in risperidone more than olanzapine. For the extrapyramidal side effects, it appears that the higher risk is in risperidone more than olanzapine. Still, each individual patient is different, and you're not off the hook if your patient is on a medicine that in groups has a lower risk of extrapyramidal or Parkinsonian side effects. You have to monitor for it in any patient on an atypical antipsychotic. Cardiovascular changes can occur with a higher risk of QTC prolongation with ziprazidone, higher risk of myocarditis with clozapine. Now, you can do the best assessment and monitoring, and sometimes you're going to have to monitor these side effects. They'll occur with the best of care. And current recommendations are to switch to a different antipsychotic with lower metabolic risk or to add an agent that targets the metabolic problem, such as metformin, if the patient experienced significant weight gain or if there's the evidence of a metabolic syndrome. You can mitigate this somewhat if you have discussions before you start the medication that these are significant side effects. What is the exercise? plan in place, what is the nutritional diet plan in place, and making sure those are implemented and checking at every session. And you'll be amazed at how infrequently that actually is done and how helpful it can be to try and organize an exercise plan proactively rather than reactively and making sure during the titration of the medication that that is in place. In terms of collaboration between behavioral health specialists and the primary care physician, this is absolutely essential and critically important part in developing and implementing a treatment plan that will most benefit the patient. And so you don't want to try and do this alone. If you're running into trouble, you're concerned about side effects, you should discuss this with a colleague, bring in our medical colleagues sooner rather than later. The key points that you need to take home are, one, antipsychotic medication is the primary treatment for schizophrenia spectrum disorders in children and adolescents. The second-generation antipsychotics are the preferred first-line treatment due to their lower risk of extrapyramidal side effects. 
the lower risk of extrapyramidal side effects, Parkinsonian events with second generation antipsychotics needs to be balanced against the increased risk of metabolic side effects such as weight gain, dyslipidemia, diabetes side effects. And due to the serious metabolic side effects, baseline and follow-up monitoring of symptoms, side effects, and laboratory tests needs to be performed as indicated.